Hey everyone, it's Chris Pistorius again with the Dental and Orthodontic Marketing Podcast. You know, we're all about uh, uh, finding great ideas, unique ideas, and things to help dental practice owners. And today is going to be no different. I've got a great guest, uh, Dr. Paul Goodman, I guess, aka Dr. Nacho is with us today. Uh, Dr. Nacho, thanks so much for joining us today. Love being here. Thanks for having me on. I love you guys. Do Love when people do stuff like this, get more stories out there on how dentists think you better. Honored to be here. Absolutely. Awesome. Well, hey, so you're a busy guy. All right. So we talked before we kind of hit the record button here. You're running this do- dental nachos that we're going to mm-hmm. talk about in a second. Um, you're a current dental practice owner and you're practicing. You're a practice broker as well. Yeah. How do you find the time to do all of this possibly and get sleep still? Uh, thank, thanks for sharing that. Well, I mean, you have to work your whole life to create unique opportunities, unique timing. So, you know, I practice six to eight days a month. I do dental practice brokering, dental nachos, speaking the other days of the month. So, you know, I was practicing as a full-time dentist. I always, I always wanted to have a collaborative dental office. So what's unique about us is we have two locations with nine dentists working there. So we can always have musical chairs of dentists. Someone can cover for me. One of the challenging parts, what we try to talk about is being a solo practice owner, can have a lot of upside, but also can have a lot of restrictions on your time when you're the only person doing it. So the first thing I did was to create a ability to replace myself in the practice with associates and other dentists there. So I sleep more than people think. I just kind of am like a friendly tornado. So kind of operate on like double speed when I'm awake. So it's uh, not always easy to be around me. Yeah. Well, that's, that's incredible. You always stay busy. So that's, I think that's a good thing, right? Yeah, for sure. So tell me about this dental nacho stuff. Obviously, I know a little bit about what's going on there, but somebody that's never heard of it or doesn't sure. know what it's all about, tell us all about it, please. Uh, it's a common thing. You wear the shirt around, people will stop you. I was getting uh, money at the ATM. Do they call it the ATM? And the guy who is the security guard said, uh, what is dental nacho? So really, it's like a Mr. Rogers neighborhood for dentists, where dentists could come together, talk, share, discuss spicy toppings. Mr. Rogers is one of my heroes. Uh, Mr. Rogers, I'm a kid of the 80s. I'm 43. He was talking about gun control, you know, racism, things that we're talking about now 30 years ago. So that show was not just for kids. If you watch uh, Won't You Be My Neighbor, an amazing show about him. So I want to create an environment where Dennis would feel safe sharing, but we also could discuss the challenges that are facing our industry, causing us to have uh, problems with our morale, challenges with money. I think one of the uh, popular term uh, now, Chris, is gaslighting. You know, and mm-hmm. I think the public says, "Oh, my dentist always seems happy." I said, "Well, that's just a fake face they put on for you when you're there because we're doing full contact arts and crafts on people who don't want to be there, so it can <laughs> be a much more stressful job than what the patients see." Right. So it's kind of a dental nacho. Like you almost think of a safe place for dentists, right? Yeah, it's the way we're, but you know, we can have spicy conversations. We also right. do a lot of things, in-person events, live stream events, yeah. CE courses. The pandemic has created an opportunity for us to do things like we're doing now. So just an, also a community for dentists to care just about as much about each other as they do about their crown preps, which I think is important. Yeah, absolutely. So you just mentioned like some of you talk about some of the top challenges in dentistry now. And, you know, that certainly changes from month to month, as we've seen from the from the recent COVID stuff. Other than COVID, I guess, or maybe you could include COVID into this. What do you think are some of the top challenges facing oh. dentists today? So I talk about the D's destroying the life of dentists. So dentistry is great. Technology, great. Stuff we can do on patients, great. Working inside of our operatories has gotten more fun, probably a little bit easier. And we can do amazing things. When you step outside the operatory, morale and life of dentists, problems. Here's one, declining insurance reimbursement. So I will use this example. Imagine if they said, you're going to exercise every day, you're going to eat right, and every year you're going to gain five pounds. That would hurt your morale. That's what's happening with insurance reimbursement for dentists. We're being paid less than we were years ago, right. even though our business costs more of the run. Our newest dentist, dental school cost has gone up two to three times as much without dentists making more money. So dental student debt affects the industry, not just the new dentist. It affects all of us. It affects decisions and where they work. It, it affects so many things. So both dental student debt and declining insurance reimbursement, I think, are two of the biggest challenges. And also the pandemic has caused many hurdles for team members. Some of them couldn't come back to work and we had to put together a whole football team to get our, our job done. Right. I had a chiropractor as a patient. I said, that must've been a relaxing job. It's just you and the table. As long as the table shows up, 
you can do your job. But I don't know if you've been in a dental office. We've got assistants, hygienists, front desk. That can be fun. But if one person's missing, I'm a big sports fan, we don't always have a bench. And that can really impact your ability to deliver care. Yeah, that's awesome. It's kind of like the next man up philosophy of yes. football, perhaps, right? Yeah, They're, but we have no we have no next man or person. Yeah. Up. Just, <laughs> just, you turn back and be like, we got nobody. So yeah. that's part of the challenges. Yeah, let's talk. Let's dive into that a little bit. Um, you know, it, it seems like a hot topic, and I ask this in almost any, every interview I do, and it's great to get different ideas here, but hiring and firing, and especially hiring and retaining employees, kind of that next man up strategy we were talking about. In your opinion, you've been around, you know this stuff. What's the best way to find great employees that are going to stick around? So first thing I always share is always be looking for team members, even when you don't need a team member. So always just be alert. So I have uh, two children that live in my house, and apparently it's still illegal to leave them home alone. So we need babysitters. (laughs) So I'm always looking for extra babysitters. So uh, life happens. I mean, dental team members, it's not an easy job. You're working shoulder to shoulder with people who don't want to be there in a high stress environment. With the pandemic, sometimes people couldn't come back to work because they're children. Sometimes people just get burned out of the industry. So one strategy is always be looking even when you don't need anyone. Number two strategy is stay connected in your community, both dental and outside of dental, because there's positions you can train people off the proverbial street. And three, Stay connected with people who are connectors, like equipment reps, like marketing companies like you, so that you can leverage that. Oftentimes, people shout out, I need a hygienist, but they don't have any relationships at that time. And there's great services out there. Some of them are sponsors of our group, but they're not magicians. So those are three things I would say is always be looking, even when you don't have a need in your office for good team members. Yeah, you know, I think that's great advice. And in your experience, I've kind of heard lately more of uh, dental practice owners and managers trying really hiring people with no experience in dental. Yeah. And the thought behind that is number one, there's more of them available, right? Right, for sure. Number two is they're finding that when they do that, yeah, there's more training. They can teach them the dental side of it, but they're finding that they're not set in their ways. They're totally coachable. Um, right. And they wind up being better employees. Have you seen that? Do you have any experience with that? Oh, yeah. We, we do that with a lot of things. There's, there's technical jobs that are hard to do that. Some not legal, yeah. like yeah. hygiene. But right. sometimes your assistant team, depending on what they're due, or your front desk team. And also, just, you know, I don't, this isn't off topic. But, you know, why does somebody have to have the same career for 40 years? I mean, is that a good thing? Meaning, like, someone who's a dental assistant, an awesome dental assistant, age 23 to 36, Maybe they're just burnt out and they want to be a rep for a supply company. And that's totally cool. So I think we just need to be comfortable with this transitioning nature of the workforce and be agile and flexible. And you've said a good point. Get good training systems in your practice so that when you do bring somebody in, you're not reinventing the wheel. Too often dentists are, are kind of held hostage in a way by this one team member who knows all these things. And I mean, also, I've had a great life, but I've also had some challenges I've had, I mean, unexpected events happen, illness, death, injury, or or happy events. Somebody's spouse has to move across the country because they got a great job as the VP of sales for something, and now they're gone. So I think dentists need to learn in school that putting your team together is something that's never finished, and you should always be working on it. Yeah, and I think it's, uh, I've I've referenced this before, but are you familiar with a book called E-Myth Revisited? Oh, yeah. Am I familiar with it? It's, a, yeah. it's near me at all times. I, like I have it right here. Yeah. Folks, this yeah, is no. not planned. I promise. Yeah, yeah. I'm these, not are my two, <laughs> these are my two favorite books, E-Myth and, uh, E-Myth and Checklist Manifesto. I have these all the time. So. Perfect. This was not rehearsed, I promise. But you said a couple of things that kind of made me think you might be onto that. And you talked about replacing yourself earlier. And then yeah. you talked a little bit just now about process procedures. And anybody watching or listening right now, this book, E-Myth Revisited, um, applies to you. I mean, it applies to almost any business. And what it really talks about um, is what Dr. Nacho was just talking about in the sense that you never know what's going to happen. So you really need to have a really good book of process procedures, you know, something that somebody even off the street could come and just kind of read the book and know how to do that job, right? Like paper still. So we have ways for people to touch something and say, these are the most eight important things from the checklist manifesto for each job. I think, you know, management is repetition. One of my consultants told me that early on is such a good point. I think dentists get frustrated where they need to learn to delegate tasks that they are able to give up, but some dentists will 
uh, micromanage too many things and cause their stress level to rise. So really it's sitting down, going through the process of creating a system, creating um, supporting assets for it, whether it's digital and paper, and then being patient enough Dennis and I, to help people when they drop their nachos or the nachos go off strip. Off strip. But what's crazy, Chris, is I say this all the time. Dental school sets dentists up to be miserable because they don't talk about any of this. Right. So they make you think that being technically competent is good. So everybody knows this experience. Everybody has in their background an amazing chef-owned restaurant where the service stunk, the food took too long, you didn't know if they opened, but the food was amazing. But you stopped going there because the other stuff was a problem. So dentists are the people trying to make their pasta so well while the other stuff they're not planning. And that's part of the reason, I believe, why they're so stressed out in private practice, because they don't even know that this is a thing until they get there. Right. Yeah, that all makes complete sense. And um, like I said, I can't say enough good things about that book, E-Myth Revisited. Yeah. It, it talks about creating a business as a franchise. Even though you're not going to be a franchise, there's a lot right. of things that you can do to to set your business up in that way. And I, I totally see some parallels on how that could work, like you mentioned, with dentistry. I'm going to switch gears just a little bit here. And you, you mentioned dental school. And this was a topic I was talking with somebody the other day about how in dental school, you know, they teach you really well how to become a dentist, right? Or in most cases, how to become a dentist. But they leave out a lot of the business aspect of this. Is that accurate? Uh, yeah, it's incredibly accurate, irresponsible, and maybe even borders on a scam. Because here's why. Dental school keeps raising their prices. They're delivering <laughs> less to the, the dental student. And they're not training them to survive and thrive in the real world. Here's an example. Dental school charges five hundred dollars or $600,000. So that's money, right? And they charge it to the dental student. Yet when the dental student is in dental school, nobody teaches them how money works in dentistry, right. which is one of the most irresponsible things. Because you, I don't, I don't, I don't know if I'm, I'm an economist, or I don't know if I'm a, a, a business whiz, but I don't think you can help anyone if your practice goes out of business. I don't think right. you'd be doing dentistry on the streets. So keeping your dental office in business is more challenging than people think. And they just give these cliches, dentists don't fail, none of them go out of business, but they have not looked at seeing what's happening in our industry with declining insurance reimbursement, with challenges that people are having. So I just think we need to start to have these conversations in dental school, so at least aware of, it, aware of these things. Yeah, we see it all the time too in, in marketing. And, you know, honestly, in, in, all, in all frankness, it's probably helped our business because, you know, these people come out of school and they're like, all right, I know how to do dentistry, but how do I grow a practice, right? Yeah. They don't know much about marketing. And unfortunately, what happens if they get in the wrong hands with the wrong people in terms of marketing, you know, they can spend a ton of money and not get anything out of it. So we see a lot of that, especially with some of the newer newer guys coming or girls coming out of school and, and, and trying to figure out what they want to do with their practice. I, I agree with you, but I would, I would encourage and not really challenge you know, if a dentist is going to spend 5% on marketing, just as an example, right. and you took all the millions of dollars of revenue, it's going to be like 0.6%. So your business has a huge pie that could grow for all companies. If dentist says, hey, I'm at least going to spend $50,000 of my million on marketing, because dentists are often very frugal, hashtag dentist cheap, I've come up with that, <laughs> on marketing. So I think in, in the most positive way, there's a huge pie for marketing companies to win if dentists get the message like, hey, I should be spending this money on marketing. Yeah, no, it totally makes sense. And, you know, especially it's it's so competitive now. And depending on the market you're in, you're getting a lot of pressure from corporate dentistry. Right. So, yeah, for sure. I, I want to I talk a little bit more about new dentists. Um, what's your advice to somebody coming out of school or maybe they've been an associate for a year or two? And they're getting that itch to maybe have their own practice. Do you feel as though it's smart right now to, to go out and, and do your own thing? What they should do is go to the per go to someone who has a three-year-old like me, tuner, and say, I want to watch it for the next week and see how <laughs> I do. Because having a dental practice is like having a three-year-old that never grows up. But in all seriousness, I think that they need to develop their core with business leadership, team communication, nothing to do with crown preps, nothing to do with extracting teeth. And see if that's the life that they want. I think one of the, if, if you know, if, if someone said to me, why are dentists have so many morale problems, stress problems, depression, death by suicide? Here's why. This is the answer. Dentistry is filled with conflict. You're talking to people who don't want to be there and don't want to pay for it. Mm -hmm. You have team members who are challenging to deal with. 
So if conflict is fighting fires, a firefighter knows they've signed up to fight fires. A dentist in the real world has no idea how much conflict they have to deal with. And as a practice owner, you have to deal with quite a bit daily. So it's all personality driven. Are you the type of personality that will do it? So buying a practice can be the key to financial success, can be the key to making uh, uh, flexible decisions. But you know what? Here's a problem, Chris. What's your spouse's job? Because if your spouse has a job where she might, he or she might move across the country, you buy a practice, you got a big problem because yeah. she, she gets a promotion or she gets to live her dream. What are you going to do with your practice? Dentistry, you know, I have two daughters. And what this pandemic has taught me is I will encourage them to do what they want in life, but I will guide them. And I will tell them that if they have a job where the only way they can make money is by physically being in front of somebody, it's a very risky job. Mm. Dentistry, hairstylist, restaurant server, because what this pandemic has taught us is dentistry is not portable. So there's great points. Everyone's going to need a dentist. Doesn't mean it's not good, but just sharing that owning a dental practice can be an anchor to that geographic region. You just want to make sure that's where you're going to be. Yeah, that's a great point. And COVID has definitely shown us that we see the people that have been the businesses that have been impacted the most dentistry, you know, anything in person, entertainment, arts, things like that. Right. So that's, that's an excellent point for sure. Thanks. Um, when you when we talk about a, somebody going to buy a new practice or they want they've made the decision, yeah, I want to do this. I want to I want to own a practice. Tell me, and, and you did this, so what was your thought process in terms of, do I start from scratch and build my own, or do I go out and look for a book of business and, and maybe maybe buy one from somebody that's retired? It's such a good question. Most of the time, buying a good acquisition is going to, you're going to buy cash flow, you're going to buy systems. So most of the time, that's what dentists do. But startups, and we work with startup consultants, we have sponsors of startup consultants, give you the opportunity to create your own brand from scratch. But it also means you likely will need to go where there's a need for a dentist. So in my area of New Jersey, we have a one to one, one dentist every thousand people, mm -hmm. very competitive. If someone came into my town and wanted to do a startup, it would be very difficult for them to survive, not because they're not a great dentist, not because I wouldn't be nice to them, just because when there's a free pizza and there's nine people, and there's eight slices, there's going to be a problem. Mm -hmm. So there's a really interesting thing happening where there's massive opportunity where you can be in a ratio of one to 3,000, one to 4,000. But I say this in the most diplomatic way. They're not often areas where people are clamoring to move to, and it, they might not be able to bring their spouse there. So I think, I don't know, I, I, there was this movie Doc Hollywood back in the day with Michael J. Fox. He got stranded yeah. in the temple. I believe that's going to happen. There's going to be towns that have no dentists. Dentists are shutting their doors and no one's replacing them because up until about the 1990s, most dentists returned to where they live to practice. Me included. Yeah. Who doesn't? Now yeah. we have all these cool people, 50, 50 men and women, more women, people from other countries. It's awesome for the field. But from a business perspective, are people going to go to the middle of Pennsylvania to buy a dental practice if they're not from the middle of Pennsylvania? Spoiler yeah. alert, they are not. Right. So, so it's a very unique challenge. Some of it comes with massive opportunity, but some of it comes with massive risk. And the first thing I say to a dentist is when they're getting a job, which is what we help them do, are you geographically flexible? If they say yes, I say you can earn twice what most dentists make, but you're going to go to Omaha, Nebraska. You're going to go to Fargo, North Dakota. Is that okay with you? So that's nobody, this is what they should tell dental school applicants, Chris, because they're really not being, uh, Total, they're not showing them the true picture of private practice dentistry before they go to school. Right. Yeah. I, I think that's a great point. And you're right. You know, people used to go to school, they'd come back, go to their hometown, set up shop, set up shop and, and, and they'd be there. Right. And, and that trend certainly is changing. So that, that's sure. very, very interesting. Um, we're going to wrap it up here, but what, what kind of parting words or nuggets of wisdom could you share with folks, you know, that are watching right now? What I would say is if you're a dentist watching, just do one thing to be kinder to a dentist near you. Call them up on the phone and do something that was normal when you were a teenager, but now I know you're all weird. Say, hey, do you want to go get lunch and just talk? I know it's going to be weird. Just say, I'd love to get to know you. I believe dentists getting to know each other, being kinder, sharing more is the key to a successful industry. I'm a huge Game of Thrones fan. So if someone's listening, yeah. Game of Thrones are going to get it. 
This is like when they didn't think the White Walkers were coming, but they were coming, <laughs> right? They were. So I'm telling you, the White Walkers are coming for dentistry. Dental insurance reimbursement, dental student debt. I work with DSOs. DSOs are a very interesting mix. That's corporate dentistry. Corporate dentistry is doing things to push the field forward, but also doing things that limit opportunities for private practitioners because a great practice will often be bought by a DSO before it gets on the open market. That's something that's been, that's our dental ancestors have let them in. So now we have to deal with that. So I would encourage you, reach out to a dentist in your town, talk to them more, go to more in person CE, be that kinder friend that you needed when you were in dental school. And that's what I hope people would do. Yeah, that's great. That's and, and that's a great analogy with the White Walkers. I like yeah, that. Right. So what if somebody's watching this and they're like, you know, I need some help. What sure. uh, Dr. Goodman's talking about here. What's the best way to reach out to you guys and, and learn more about your program? Uh, thanks so much for letting me share that. So dentalnachos.com, I've tried to create like an ESPN version of what we do from buying practices, CE events. So you go to dentalnachos.com. And then one of my best friend, friends in life, I, I brought I brought him. It's my phone. So you could just text nachos to 215-543-6454. If you text nachos to 215-543-6454, one of my idols is Gary Vaynerchuk, Gary V. And I got the same community text platform that he has. And um, it's been a great way to connect with people because you text in and you're texting me. We can have a conversation, ask me a question. I really love it. So thanks so much for letting me share that. Nice. Yeah. And I'll make sure we put that information uh, below the post and everywhere that this awesome. is going to be broadcast. So, hey, Dr. Goodman, seriously, thanks so much for your time. I know how busy you are. This, is, this has been really fun and a lot of really good information. So I appreciate you being with us today. Thanks, Chris. I really appreciate it. Sure thing. And thank you to everybody that's watched this episode of the Dental and uh, Orthodontic Marketing Podcast. Uh, please be sure to check in with us next week for another great show. Thanks again.